Well, hello, everybody. Good to see you all out here at the church. Welcome. It's, uh, it's good to see everyone here. Um, didn't we have a good week last week with the baptisms? Yes, we did, didn't we? Lovely service for us to share in uh, as we celebrated what Jesus has been doing in the life of a couple of people among our church family. So that was lovely. Uh, this week we do share in communion as well towards the end of our service. So we'll, we'll look forward to sharing in that together a little later on. Uh, a couple of things just to mention as we get going. First of all, just a reminder to say that next Sunday, it's coming up quickly now, is the spring church meal. Um, Woohoo, I know. Um, uh, so that's coming up next Sunday afternoon at five o'clock. So uh, there's uh, quite a few names signed up on the list already. Um, but if you'd like to come along to that, there's some lovely meal options. We'll have a bit of fun in the afternoon as well. Five o'clock onwards, do come along and we'll share share in a church meal. And any funds that we raise from that, from donations at all, uh, beyond costs, will go towards the uh, church roofing project. Um, so also to say, a reminder about Eric Little, the Chariot of Fire, um, just to say again that there are some leaflets and posters at the back. If you live in a block of flats, if you're able to put them up somewhere, just a good way of publicizing it. So do take some of those away if you'd like to, or if you've got friends or family who might want to come along. It's uh, adults, 12 pounds, over 65s, 10, and under 16s, 8 pounds. Bargain, is what I say. <laughs> But if you'd like to come along to that, please do. That is on the 29th of June at 7.30. Uh, and then just to say as well that we've got a members meeting after the service uh, today, but there will be refreshments served as ever uh, in the church hall before we start that meeting too. Right, I think those are all of the notices for this morning. Uh, I'm going to read to us from Psalm 46. Uh, obviously, over the course of the last 24 hours or so, great concern in our world, isn't there, over what's going on particularly in the Middle East. Um, we'll pray in a moment for that, but I thought I'd read from Psalm 46 because I think it helps frame our perspective on things as we look at our God this morning. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There's a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall, God will help her at the break of day. Nations, though, are in uproar, kingdoms fall, he lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us, the God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done. The desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Aren't we glad that we are not in charge and in control of our world? We say it often here at the church. We are so thankful that we have a God who is and who works all things out in accordance with his purpose. But we're also asked to pray. And so let's commit our time to him now. And let's also pray for our world too. Lord, we thank you that this uh, psalm reminds us that you are our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. We thank you that it encourages us not to fear even if the earth around us seems like it is in chaos. Lord God, we thank you that we can see what you are doing. And where we've got questions, Lord God, you call us to trust. We thank you that you promised to, to break the bow and shatter the spear, that one day that will be a reality when Jesus returns. We thank you that you call us to be still and know that you are God, that you will be exalted among the nations, you will be exalted in the earth, and you are doing that work even at this very moment. Lord God, we lift our world to you. We pray for your presence over it. We pray for your peace for it, Lord. Especially as we think over the events of the last 24 hours, we pray for your peace in the Middle East for a de-escalating of tensions. Lord God, may you be at work. 
Father, we're so conscious as we gather in this place this morning that we do not have all the answers. We don't have the answers to the problems of our own lives often, let alone the wider problems of our world. And yet you are the God who does. And so as we gather this morning and as we think about the holy God whom we come before, the God who we can open the pages of the Bible and discover more about, we are thankful, Lord God, that as we look to you, that you are the faithful God towards us the faithful God towards your people. Father, help us to trust as we commit our world, our lives, and indeed, Lord, this service now as we praise and worship you. May you be at work and may you be present with us by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's sing about our wonderful God. We're going to stand and sing only a holy God, followed by oh for a thousand tongues to sing. Let's stand together.
sing it then if it's not there. <laughs> Take a seat, everyone. <laughs> Apologies about that. Perhaps if we can get it loaded up, we can have it a bit later. I don't know. But anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens. Anyway, S Sarah, I'm going to need you at the front now. So, you know, not, not that you're double jobbing this morning, but um, uh, we're going to read from God's Word uh, as we do on our Communion Sundays. We do have a, a, a message before we come to Communion. Uh, we're carrying on looking at the Sermon on the Mount this morning. Come on, run, 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 run. You're coming. Um, <laughs> I'm filling time, right? Um, we're going to look together, though, at the next passage from the Sermon on the Mount, uh, from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 to 34. So page 971, if you want to find it in the Green Bibles, um, or uh, it's going to appear, well, I don't know, is it going to appear? We'll see in a minute, on the screen behind me. Not that they've got enough to do at the back this morning. Um, but Sarah's going to read it for us now. Thank you. Okay, so Matthew chapter 6, beginning at verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labour or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all his splendour, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, it's all right. <laughs> well, let's think on these words and what it encourages us towards this morning. We were saying that's a really good passage for a treasurer to read as well. Yeah. Um, it's amazing what people will do to find buried treasure. Uh, a few years ago, there was a story broke from the, from the States of an art dealer and author, a guy called Forrest Fenn from Santa Fe, who, who decided to hide a box of buried treasure. Uh, his net worth was in, in the millions, and he and his wife owned an art gallery, which I think made a, a tidy sum each year. Uh, the box, he said, it contained all sorts of gold nuggets. There was some jewelry, apparently. There were some rare coins and gemstones. Uh, they estimated that the, 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 the value of the box itself was about two million in total. You can see why you might want to find it. Um, and what he decided to do was hide this box somewhere up in the Rocky Mountains, in his own words, wanting to get people out and about in the open air after he himself had had a, uh, a cancer diagnosis. Uh, so in 2010, he published a, a book. It was as a memoir in which he provided stories from his life which he said gave little clues as to where this treasure might be located. He included a, a cryptic poem uh, describing some of the landscape features that one might use in the Rocky Mountains to find the treasure. 
And, and they reckon that inspired by this book and this promise of treasure somewhere, that an estimated 350,000 people over the coming years tried to locate where the treasure was. Eventually, it was found 10 years later in 2020, just a few months before Forrest passed away at the age of 90. He said it was found exactly where he had buried it over 10 years previously. No one had managed to locate it since then, and the chap who did locate it, well, <laughs> what a lucky guy at the end of the day. Some people, though, spent vast amounts of sums trying to find the treasure. Some were professional treasure seekers out and about for, for, for weeks on end sometimes, looking for the treasure. In fact, five people lost their lives searching for it. Forrest had to go on record at one point to say that wherever it was hidden, it was nowhere precarious and only somewhere that a near 80-year-old man could carry a box like that. Isn't it funny what treasure does to us? It's a funny thing, isn't it? It can make people do strange things. It can cause people to take risks, perhaps, that they might not otherwise take it. It inspires storytelling and myth and legend and Pirates of the Caribbean films and many wolves besides. And it proves that in a material world, material things really do hold value for people, don't they? They really do. And yet, as we jump back into the Sermon on the Mount this week, we've been out of it for, for a couple of weeks now, we find that Jesus, as he continues this, this magnificent sermon, dare we say the best sermon ever, on what the kingdom of God should look like for his followers, we pick it up with this very famous expression, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth. It's a very famous expression from the Bible, isn't it? We may well have heard it before. What are we supposed to make of this then when we live in a material world? I mean, what, what does Jesus himself mean by this statement? And how do we then apply it to our lives in the following, from the following verses? And it's like this with all of the Sermon on the Mount, really. With every single passage you come across, what Jesus is doing is that he's getting people to think. He's getting people to try and really think about here, treasures and possessions and, and material things from a, a material world. That sounds like you're about to break into song, doesn't it? And perhaps even more than beyond just the things that we own, how a, a kingdom-minded person following him seeks to live in our very materially-based world in which we live. And the, the first way in which he challenges his followers is he says that we should pursue heavenly thinking. Now, you may well have noticed as we were going through uh, that reading together, uh, Jesus is the master of using contrast to make the points that he does. Uh, we heard it in, in chapter 5 when he, he used, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you. Contrast was the way that he, he explained how God's written laws in the Bible are actually far more significant than we might think, and, and they impact something far deeper within us when rightly applied, namely our hearts, which which here would make sense of the comment that he makes in verse 21. For where your treasure is, Jesus says, there your heart will be also. He's always trying to get in here, isn't he? He's not just getting us to sort of pass over things and quickly move on to the next thing. He's always trying to get to us, get, get, get to something within us in here, something in our hearts that he wants us to take on board. Uh, take this first point about treasure. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, he says, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. Uh, when, when you think about it, it's actually a very um, practical point to make, isn't it? Uh, things do rust, rust. Moths and vermin do destroy things. People break in and steal. You know, in fact, it's a highly practical point. Uh, you know, I remember myself when I was at Moreland's. I remember taking a, a bike with me when I was in my first year then. I thought it might be nice, given where it was, it's located, to, to do a bit of cycling around the area. And given I had a bike, may as well have it with me whilst I was studying there. In three years of study, guess how many times I took the bike out? Zero. 
Zero times I took the back out, bike out, which probably tells you how much I enjoy cycling for leisure purposes. I know some really love it, though. It stayed locked up in the bike shed at Morelands for three years, and when I finally remembered that it was there when I, when I finished and went to retrieve it before I left, what do you think had happened to it? It looked like a total rust bucket. Rusty through and through, and I tried to deal with some of it without much, much success in getting it operational again. I eventually had to cut my losses and dispose of this bike because it was, was in such poor condition. Fortunately, it wasn't uh, an expensive bike. It was fairly cheap, but it was, it was beyond serviceable repair. But it makes a point that we all know is true. Things on earth don't last, do they? They just don't. I mean, we're supposed to look after the things on earth. My bad. But things do not last, do they? Things rust, they degrade, they break, they don't last, and we know that full well. Money gets spent, and we wonder what on. It's so fleeting. And so perhaps it isn't hard to, from a Christian's viewpoint anyway, to get what Jesus is saying. Don't put all your eggs into gaining earthly treasures where things will wear out, get destroyed, where thieves break in and steal. He says to the people watching on, think about eternity. Think in a slightly different way that, uh, that lets, uh, and let it lead you and guide you as to what you should then do. Now, there's a few things about this because Christians can get quite wound up about this kind of thing, about possessions and so on and so forth, and about what, what the Bible really says. Jesus is not saying, okay, he's not saying that we should not enjoy the good gifts that God has given. He's not saying that. He's not saying uh, don't work for a living. He's not saying don't plan for the future. He's not saying uh, don't save or, or don't purchase property or, or don't put things aside so, so family can be supported. You know, th there is far enough warrant in Scripture to tell us that, that God doesn't expect us to necessarily live hand to mouth daily. I mean, let's face it, in our, in our, in our Western world, we can't actually do, on, do that anyway. It's nigh on impossible when you've got rents and mortgages and all the other bills and financial obligations we have just for living where we do. So Jesus is not, he's not anti-living. He's not anti-us living or anti-us having possessions. He's simply making a point. He's simply saying, is all of this around you worth your primary attention if what we should really be doing is keeping eternity and all that God has given us truly in mind? Things get ruined, don't they? In eternity, nothing ever will. That's a fairly good trade-off, by the way, when you think about it. You want a good trade-off for what you work for here on earth. Jesus says, put it firmly not in the things of this world, but in the things of heaven. Maybe growing to become more Christ-like, giving, giving time to what truly does matter in life, pursuing God's ways, serving other people, sharing the gospel, you know, working in the best ways you can in the roles that you have to somehow perhaps convince some, of the, some people of the goodness of God at work in our world and be a witness. Let's face it, you can live with an eternal mindset whilst doing very practical things here on earth. So where primarily do we ourselves see our treasure? What are we looking towards with our lives? Where do we put, what do we put as a priority? But he's not done yet. He continues. Second, is anything clouding our vision? He says he talks about vision. The eye is the lamp of the body, he carries on. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? Now, I'm quite fortunate with vision at the moment anyway. Fortunately, I've inherited the, the better genes within our, our family in this area. But our, our eyes are amazing things, aren't they? They are amazing. I'm always amazed when I go for an eye test, you know, just how much they can show you about your eyes these days with the various imagings and, 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 uh, and things that they can do to, to show you what's going on. Uh, the, the last time I went for an eye test, I, I, I was told that apparently I've got a, very, I've got a, a curvature to part uh, on one of my lenses on one of my eyes. But the amazing thing about the way our bodies work is that another part of my eye also has another curvature which cancels the first one out, so I'm okay bizarre, isn't it? We are so complex as people. 
But the point Jesus makes about our eyes and what we see and how we see things is also fairly clear too. If your eyes are healthy, you'll see well. Let things cloud your vision, either by definite decision or simply perhaps the passage of time, and everything can quickly become unhealthy. Perhaps, you know, let circumstances dictate the way you think or feel. You can soon end up getting discontented or angry. Let possessions or making it in the world become what you focus on, and very soon the light of God can begin to fade in your life because we begin caring so much about the things around us. And there is something very important to all this. Really what he's saying is, allow the ways of the world, worldly thinking if you like, which is always striving after more in some way in this world, be it uh, more power, more wealth, more influence, more of just about anything in our world that our world seems to put a priority on at the top of the value charts. And very soon, our eyes can become unhealthy. Our vision gets blurred. Things get in the way. We fall prey to the vices of our world and the way it operates. You know, with all of its anger, with all of its making it mentality, the the my rights philosophy of our age, you know, the demanding nature that our world seems to have fallen into, particularly in our Western world, a society which which teaches discontentment at, at its core. Even through our advertising, that's true, isn't it? It teaches discontentment at its core. The grass is greener on the other side kind of thinking. If I could just have, or I could just get, or I could just do, or I could just be, we think. When God has in fact given amazing things for each of us, and for each of us to pursue in the way that he's gifted us, and given to us, and put people before us to serve. But it's very true, isn't it? If those things before us, the very things that we do focus on, become what we think is light, when it may just be faulty ambition or thinking or goal setting for ourselves, it can so easily cloud what we pursue and think about and consider. It can become what Jesus describes as darkness. And if what we focus on believing it to be light, when only God is light, so that darkness can become great. You know, when when God's Word, and this is really what the sermon's all about, when God's Word paints the most fulfilling life, a life that, that can be lived to the full for Him, if only we let His light shine into our lives to lead us and guide us in every way, so He says, live that way. Let that light shine. See the goodness of God and put Him first. I mean, he continues, doesn't he? At the end of the day, he says, no one can serve two masters. You just can't do it, he says. You can't do it. Try to serve God and money, and it just cannot work. You'd always put one above the other. That's true of anything in life, isn't it? It's true of anything. Put it before God, and it'll always seek to take over. And in fact, it will, if you let it. Because we'll prioritize it more than God. We'll make our decision by it rather than by God and what he says. If we follow it more than God and keep it fixed in our minds more than him, then of course, of course that's the way we're going to live our lives. Which is why he says, God first. Put him first and his ways. I mean, they say, don't they? (laughs) You are what you eat. Well, I'm afraid not in this instance. In this instance, it's you are what you think and prioritize, and let influence us, what we place as first importance. You are the ways in which you decide to act, the, way, the words you use. And all that begins in the way you think about life, and yourself, and God, and others. That's where this dynamic works. He says, you can't serve two masters here. And he's talking about earthly things. Either you'll hate one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. He basically says, you can't love God and prioritize earthly things over him. You just can't do it effectively. Live life, sure. Earn money, absolutely. Do you know, there have been some people who have been gifted to earn money to, and earn a lot of it, who then invest it back into God's kingdom. God is not anti-money. He's not anti-money. Sometimes people do that because that is what God has called them to do with the skills he has given. But make that your goal 
and it will certainly cloud how we see God. Which gets us to the second half of the passage, by the way, and where Jesus gets very practical with us. It's funny, isn't it? Because Jesus often does things that you don't expect. I mean, he's just talked about treasures on earth and treasures in heaven. And you think, okay, right, fair enough. We get the point. Put him first, right, okay. What are you going to say next, Jesus? But then he takes it away from that, almost, it feels, and he talks about something else, which you think, how is this going to work? What's he going to talk about here? Because he goes on to say that basically when we've grasped all that, we've grasped and chosen to live that kind of a way with God first, with that kind of thinking, a heavenly mindset, that we can then apply the benefits of what he is saying to very practical things that our lives really do surround ourselves with in the here and now, things that we have problems with in the here and now, things we all contend with. And where does he go to? Well, he goes to earthly worry. (laughs) Right, okay. Go from treasures to worries. How's this going to work? I mean, because let's face it, don't we all struggle with that? Worry? (laughs) Anyone hand up? Yeah, right. (laughs) We all struggle with worry. What's he going to say about this? Do you know, it is funny. There was a study that was done a few years ago just on this topic about worry. And it was found that 85%, okay, 85% of what people worry about never happens. Think about that for a second. 85% of the things we worry about never happen. With the 15% that's left on top of that, they also found something else that was interesting. A further 12% of people, where the things did happen that they were worrying about, they discovered either that they could handle the difficulty better than they expected, or that the difficulty taught them a lesson that was worth learning, okay? Further 12%. Now, do the math, as the Americans would say. Where does that leave us? That leaves us with 3% of things that either do happen and we worry about that we don't learn something from or that we don't find helpful in some sort of a way in the long-term picture. 3% of the things that we worry about. There was a guy, there was a guy 500 years ago called Michael de Montaigne, one of the leading philosophers of 16th century France, who when he reflected on his life, he concluded this. He said, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which has never happened, because it was all up here. He imagined it, and he worried about it. Now, can you see the links with what Jesus has just said? Can you see it? He's just implored us to think with a heavenly perspective about life, about our ambitions, about our attitudes towards possessions. Now he asks us to apply that thinking to life, even to one of the core strongholds of life that we grapple with here on earth, the very things that we worry about. Here's the thing. Take a heavenly perspective about God and your life and what Jesus has done for you, and you might just find, he's saying, that it impacts things you've held on to even for years. Or it might just impact the situation that might happen tomorrow that you know nothing about. Jesus says to us, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life. Look heavenwards and do not worry. Now I know, because I do know, (laughs) easily said, not always easily done. But begin taking that kind of mindset and you might just see things change. And here's how he paints it. Here's how he he presents this to us. Here's, Here's the rationale, first of all, that he says. And we'll just go through these together. He says, first of all, isn't there more to life? Isn't there more to life? First, think heavenly thoughts and do not worry. For is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? Isn't there more to life than what we eat and how we look? What image we present to others? We can spend so much time in worry about those things. And not just, I mean, how we look, but how we might present things, or perhaps whether we will say things right, how we, how we say things before other people too, whether, whether people will accept us or, or what we say. Now, that doesn't mean that we should just go, you know, blustering on through being nasty or with little thoughts simply because we're doing what Jesus says and not worrying. But it does challenge the way we think about worry in life, in terms of who we are. 
Isn't there more, he says, than image or food as we walk our earthly walk with God? He's certainly not worried about those, it seems. So should we be as worried as we are? Uh, Second on worry, he says, you want to know how much you are actually cared for in life. And I love this. He says, go for a walk. Doesn't actually say this, but go with me. Go for a walk. Go to the cliff tops or into the forest. Go and look at the birds. Go and do that for me, won't you? Go and look at the birds. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow or reap or stow, store away in barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are they not more, much more? Are you not much more valuable than they? He says, become an ornithologist for a moment. Those of you who like bird watching, this one's for you. But it's for us all as well. Go and look at the birds and consider them for a minute and see how much more valuable you are than they. Do you think God doesn't care? Looks after them. Won't he look after you? If God values us as, as first priority, is that not more important than our perhaps our standard of life? The image you present. God loves us, you. He cares for you. He provides for you. Look at the birds. Just go and have a walk this afternoon and look at the birds and remember what God has done. Now, some might say, but yes, okay, right, fair enough, but how can God provide for all? You know, we look around our world and we see it's full of problems. You know, well, we look around our world at the moment. What about the, the starving family in Gaza? Or those who were at the Forget Thee Not group yesterday in, in Uganda, as we were hearing about? Well, The issue with that is, it's not so much that God hasn't provided, it's that we've got it wrong. Isn't it that way around? It's not an issue of provision, but it's an issue of equitability of food, surely. God's not saying birds don't have to go and gather food to be provided for. He's equally not saying there isn't enough food in this world for all to be provided for. You know, had humanity, governments, and even ourselves been sharing what we have in the right ways? None of that reflects on God. He's provided what we need. It reflects on people. The truth is this. He does provide for all. He provides even for birds in his creation. And he says, consider them, lovely though they are, and from whom we can learn a lot. And then says, and remember this too, aren't you much more valuable than they? His reasoning builds. Uh, Then very practically he says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? The answer being, by the way, no, we can't. You want a very practical solution for all of this? Well, take that one to heart. Worry doesn't add to life, does it? I mean, it adds nothing, in fact, and it always costs something. It always costs something. It costs something in things in stress, in time, in energy. We all know that full well. Medical science knows that full well. Let's face it, our mental health knows it full well at times, doesn't it? So Jesus implores us, can you add to your life by worrying? 85% of those things don't happen the way we worry they will. God knows how those things will happen, which is why we're called to bring everything to him in prayer and trust him with life's outcomes. Now, don't get me wrong, okay? I'm a realist, or at least I like to think I am. I'm a realist. We we will all worry, won't we? We will all worry. I worry, you worry, I'm sure. We all worry to one degree or another. Jesus isn't denying that, that we can or will continue worrying, even after we've heard his words. There is no such thing, is there, as a magical wand that we just sort of wave around having heard the words of Jesus and go, okay, well, everything's fixed now. <laughs> it doesn't work that way, does it, practically speaking, in our lives? But what he is doing here is he is giving us good reasons, good encouragements, good blessings which by his spirit we can apply to our lives and take them on board and learn from them and grow in them and and, and further apply them to our lives to remind ourselves of what to do and think when we do find ourselves worrying. Look at the birds. Can you add to your life? Isn't there more to life than this? Doesn't God provide? Those are at the end of the day all Good reasons to trust when we take God's perspective, a heavenly perspective, to heart. 
Why worry about clothes, he continues. <laughs> See how the flowers of the field grow. Here's one for the botanists. If there ever was a biblical warrant for you gardeners among us today, here it also is. See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, the great king of Israel, in all his splendor, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Now, don't get me wrong, Jesus isn't going around with the people that were standing before him and going, oh, yeah, you of little faith, or you of little faith, or you of little faith. He's not pointing the finger at us and saying that. He's not saying, buck up your ideas or I'll have you for worrying. That's not what he's telling us. He's simply saying, look at me. Look at me. Look at the world I've made and consider what that does to your faith. Because at the end of the day, we all feel like we've got little faith when it comes to worry. Because it can take over. He says, look at me. Look at the world I've made. Where is your faith? What does it do to your faith? Why do you worry so much about these earthly things? Give them to me. Pursue my ways and live. And maybe just worry that little bit less. I mean, what does he go on to say later in Matthew's Gospel? He goes on to say, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Or perhaps you could also rephrase it. Your heavenly Father knows what you need. He knows your need, and he knows that you need them. Verse 32. Because isn't that the difference, really, with, between a heavenly perspective on life and an earthly one? Those who live an earthly life, who, who don't perhaps believe in God, who don't trust in his grace, what else is there to look at but this world? What else is there to trust in but this world? That is it, basically, what Jesus says. When he talks about the pagans, that's what he's talking about. People who simply do not believe in a God. Not in a God who provides personally, anyway. What else is there but this world? But for, for, for the Christian, he says, your heavenly Father knows your need. That is, in fact, what Jesus said, if you remember, about prayer, just before the Lord's Prayer in this message. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. That doesn't mean we don't go and pray about those things because we're to be a dependent people. But it means we don't babble on thinking we're going to be heard for our many words, he says. Your, your heavenly Father knows what you need. We simply pray with trust because we can trust him and we let that soothe our anxieties. That is the heavenly way, Jesus says. And then the last reason to worry that he says, well, he simply says, it's not practical. Haven't we got enough day by day, he says. It's not practical. Is it really worth worrying about what tomorrow might bring? Won't tomorrow worry about itself when the time comes? Won't there be enough for the, for the day then? Doesn't each day, he says, have enough trouble of its own? How true can that be at times? Verse 34. All of this tells us, I think, that we have so much still to learn, doesn't it? So much still to learn about God, about the magnificence of who he is and what he has done for us. So much we have to day by day apply to our lives as we live for him. So much so that, as he says, we need to think about and think through properly so that we can then apply it to our lives because the Christian faith is not a passive faith. It's an active one that quite requires active decision and thinking and working things through and reading and working them out before God. So he says, apply this, think it through. There is so much we have still to learn. And we're going to leave the passage before we come to communion with the words of Jesus in verse 33 that really sum up where our, our ambitions and motivations and simply our thoughts about life in general should be. For if you wanted one command, one command, one encouragement, one, this is what I should do on this day and all the others to come, these words provide that answer in verse 33. He says this as his summary statement. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, 
and all these things will be given to you as well. That's his summary statement of the whole thing. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. He knows our need. That's what we do day by day with our lives. This week as we go into it, we do that. We do that. Seek first his kingdom. The kingdom of God, let's face it, begins in anyone's life when they humble themselves, when they repent of their sin, when they believe in Jesus as their Savior and they they pledge to submit to his ways as our personal king. That's where the kingdom of God starts in our lives. It's not something that we can have by osmosis. It's not something that comes by family or anything like that. Every person, every man, woman, and child has to make that decision to come before the King of Kings and submit themselves to him. That's what it means to seek first his kingdom. Seek him first and commit ourselves to him over our our personal lives, over what we eat, what we drink, what we wear, over what we treasure, over our perspectives on life and and about other people, over money and what we actually earn for a living. All of these things, to submit it to him means being a kingdom Christian, to live as a true Christian who follows Jesus. And, and we get lifted out by that, out of our own desires. We get lifted into a kingdom full of Jesus' desires. A kingdom that is, let's face it, is full of great things. Good things for us and, and given to us. Not to stay with us so that we hoard them as, as, as ourselves, but to serve him and others, which is the most fulfilled a life can actually be. That's why we're given what we're given. That's why we're provided for. That's why he implores for us to have a heavenly mindset, because it's only when we've got that, or are growing in that at least, that all the other things in life fall into place, and indeed into their proper place. Seek first His kingdom, he says, in your lives. And all this will be given to you as well. That's the promise. And then he says, seek first his righteousness too. What does that mean, righteousness? It simply means all that is right and good before God. All that is right and good before God. In our world, in our our lives. Not the, the selfish things. Not the grudges we hold on to. Not treating people badly, but seeking first God's righteousness, which is right and actually right, not just our opinions. And all of these things will be added to you as well. You see, it's both in here, the kingdom of God as it grows in us, as it transforms lives from the inside out, that it is God at work who does his work in us, it's within us. But he's also saying it's outside of us too. It's how we do things on the outside as well, that the fruit of our life, the the gifts we wonderfully get to use, the ways we serve, the attitudes that we hold, the rightness of God's world in a world that wants to live its own way, the generosity of God in a world that is so inward thinking and inward leading so as to be far away from what God knows is good for us. Indeed, it encourages us, doesn't it, towards those things that are going to cause us to worry less at the end of the day, that help us to live gratefully all the more. Because this heavenly Father knows what we need and knows how we should live. So in sum, that's a summary statement. Seek first his kingdom, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Apply that to your life this week as you go into it. Apply it to the way that you think. Apply it to the way you interact with people. Apply it to the way you you consider the things around you in your possessions. Apply it even to the anxious thoughts that go on in your hearts and minds. And you never know, God might even begin to change those as well. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. All these things will be given to you as well. And you know, as we come to communion this morning, this reminds us of where this all begins, doesn't it? It reminds us about where this all starts for us. Because communion itself points not just to something we do outwardly, but it points to our hearts and what's going on in here. It's what Jesus has done for each and every one of us. 
Those who have put their faith in Jesus are called to the table of communion to say, this is what I believe. This is what I trust in. This is what I have come to know. This is whom I've come to know. The Lord Jesus, my Savior. The one who I have given my life to. The one who I do come before. The one that I live my life before. This is where all of this begins. Seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness starts with the very emblems that communion represents. Because God wants to work in our hearts and our minds. To come before him humbly to seek him, to find him, to know him, and to love him in the same way that communion demonstrates his love towards us. So we're going to share in just a few moments in communion together. Before we do, we're going to pray, though, and we're going to sing before we get there. I think we've got two songs. Oh, no, we've got one song. (laughs) One song. (laughs) But let's pray and commit what we've heard to him. Lord God, thank you that we can trust in you. Uh, We're so conscious, Lord, that the things of the earth, they can easily rust and fall away. That our perspectives can get so caught up in ourselves, in our circumstances, in the situations we find ourselves in. Even those things around us, Lord God, that we place such a value on. We're so conscious that we live in a material world that gets us to focus on material things. And yet in your goodness and your mercy and your love for us, you give us the ability to see beyond that. To to, to look up, to, to look at the great author of creation, the restorer of our lives. And to see that you have a much grander purpose, a far greater perspective, a wonderful gift that you have given to us in Jesus our Lord. The one who spoke these very words. The one who who calls us to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness for our lives. That it starts in us, Lord, as it goes outwards into our world. That it affects the way we even think about life. That it affects the way we think about possessions. It, thinks, forget, it affects the way we think about even our very selves. Because it gets us looking beyond ourself to the great God of the universe and what you are doing. The great provider of all things. The one who says to us, do not worry. I've got this. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Look what I've done. See those things. Hear what I've said. And trust me. And so, Lord, we're so grateful that we can have this perspective. And not just that we can have this perspective as if it's all about ourselves. It's only because you are there. That you have revealed yourself to us. And you have given your son to us in Jesus. As we share in communion in just a few moments' time. So help us, Lord, bless us, enable us to look with fresh eyes on what you're calling us to do and how you are calling us to think. And may we honor you as we do so. In your name, amen. Have we got thank you for saving me? That's the, I was looking for the thumbs up. Shall we stand together and sing, thank you for saving me? and remind ourselves of what Jesus has done.
please take a seat again. And let's just spend a moment, as we should, before we come to the table, to reflect, to think, to bring before our Lord anything we need to bring. We're called to examine ourselves before we eat and drink. Is there anything we need to bring before our Lord? Any grudge we bear? Anything we need to resolve in our hearts and come humbly before him before we take? Let's do so now. Lord, we are so conscious as we come to an act like communion that we are such a frail and fragile people. Lord God, we're so conscious that we have been saved from our own sin. We're conscious, Lord, that our lives are not perfect. And yet, Lord, in your grace, you have given us a Savior. You've given us a Lord to follow. You've given us someone whom we all have to humbly come before and humble ourselves before, resolving what is in our hearts before you, taking that heavenly perspective to do as you ask. Lord God, help us, we pray, as we remember the body and the blood of Jesus, our Savior, as we acknowledge one another in that, Lord, as your people. Father, bless us, help us, call us to trust. Lead us, Lord, to your forgiveness. And help us in that way to have your light shining into our hearts and minds as we think on you and as we think on others. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. We read in Scripture, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's why in these words we have to resolve to live for him as we take it. To be found in his mercy and his grace before him and with others. So let us take these. And this is open to anyone who is a believer. Anyone who can look at these elements and say, yes, I do. I trust in the body and blood of Christ. I've come to know him myself as my Lord and Savior. I know I've done those things before him. I know I've been forgiven of my sin and will continue to need to be forgiven. I know that he has rescued me and saved me. And these are the emblems of that. If you can say that, partake of these elements. If you're not sure, if you're not sure who Jesus is for you, if you've not quite come to that place of saying, yes, I can say I believe, then we don't want anyone to do anything they feel uncomfortable with. Just let these pass you by. And perhaps use the time to think, what do I believe? 
What do I think about this Savior whom we hear about week by week here at the church? But if you know and love him, as we come before him humbly, let's share together in the body and blood. Please take a bit of bread as you receive it. And then we'll hold on to the cup in a moment and share together. Thank you.
let us remember the gift of our Savior, the blood of Christ. Father, as we conclude our service in just a few moments, and as we have remembered you, may you help us this week as we go into it to live with that heavenly perspective in mind, to keep you central in our lives, central in our thoughts, central in our worries and struggles. Central, Lord God, because you are the King. Bless us, we pray, for all that may come about. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We've got one more song that we're going to sing before we come, uh, before we finish our service together. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. It's the way we're supposed to do things. Let's stand together and sing. Until I stand with joy